All right. Welcome back to Blue by 90. I'm Justin, joined by Tanner today. And Paul Bunyan is staying in Ann Arbor. Feels good. It feels good to get one. It does. You know, and I said this uh, pre show, and I think it makes a lot of sense, and I hope that I don't mess it up. But sometimes you play Michigan State, and it's a weird, sloppy game, and you lose, and you're very sad. And sometimes you play Michigan State, and it's a weird, sloppy game, and you win, and you're very happy. So you take the outcome where you get to keep Paul, get those bragging rights, you know, kind of a kind of a down season for Michigan thus far. But that one felt nice. That one was really nice to get the win. I had some I watched it at home. Tailgate was electric on Saturday. I'm sure we'll touch on that. But, you know, just when Michigan was able to run out the clock, I gave a nice, you know, fist pump. So like Tiger Woods in my in my <laughs> living room. And was just very happy to to close that one out. Got a little hairy. We'll talk about it, but he, he, he I, wins a win. A win. A win's a win. I I love beating Michigan State, and I want to say this to any you know any MSU fans that are out there. I I was gonna tweet this actually too. Like, listen, I'll admit it. We care. We care about that game. We care about the rivalry. We care a lot. Actually, turns out, and. I love beating them. I, I love it so much. It it honestly it the fan base over there, I don't know. I the the post game reactions to everything. I know there was the fight, which we can get into in a little bit, but like it, it was it was a meltdown from Sparties. Like I man, for two four and three teams in like the least meaningful game in this rivalry's history, maybe at least in the past, I don't know. 15 years uh, you know for them to care as much as they did was shocking is it though it's not it's not but it's just i guess not for them to care as much as they did but but for them to react the way that they did again still not really that shocking but but like i mean it, it was it was wild i was scrolling twitter on the way home and i was just like man this is like this rivalry is as alive as it could get. Yeah, well, do you want to talk about the post game stuff? Because I have a lot of thoughts on that, and I think it's hilarious. Yeah, let's, let's get into it, and then we can break down the game. Uh, let's start yeah. there, though, because it like unfortunately it turned out after the game to be like what everyone was talking about. Yeah, no. So th- th- there's a couple things, and uh, there's a couple thoughts that I have. So first of all, when you're kneeling the game out, right? And you've seen this in the NFL with Greg Schiano when he was the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and his team is going low on the kneel downs and they're coming off the ball. And yeah, look, it is football, right? You play it till the end game's over. And so when you do stuff like that, I, my favorite thing about this is seeing the videos where it's edited perfectly to cut out the, the hand swipe. Right. Right. Cause I'm not going to call it a punch. In the same way that I don't think Colson Loveland, should, what he did should be considered a headbutt. You have helmets on. Guys celebrate with their teammates by, you know, love tapping their face masks. Correct. But it's very funny for people to come on here or go on Twitter or whatever and say, oh, Colson Loveland, he headbutted him. First of all, you shouldn't be going, you should not be acting like that on a kneel down. You should not be swiping your hand at somebody's face mask on a kneel down and you shouldn't be surprised when you get pushed back. Right. Right. I now I do think even Colston said like he got carried away, right. A little bit too. Cause so like at the end of the day, should both, nobody should be doing anything. Right. Like he should just, you know, Hey, he just beat their ass. Right. He played well. He's dominated them in the last three years. He's uh, outscored or, them. He's outscored them 28, 24. So first of all, I'll say this. Colston, you can talk whatever shit you want to talk. That that's what ha- that's how this works. If you dominate that that badly, you can say whatever you want to say. And so him saying the little bro comment, like, you know, I personally don't like the little bro comment. I wish we would get away from it, but if the Why shoe are you fits, doing that on a kneel down? The shoe fits, Tanner. It's a kneel down, and I'm sure we're gonna have you know, because other other fan bases watch our show, and I'm sure we'll have some nice comments or very friendly comments uh, in our in our section down there really? on YouTube. But I just I don't know. Um, I just find that <laughs> it's so funny too because 
you know, you see a lot of people are like, oh, Michigan's playing victim again. And I'm like, when you say again, do you mean the time that Jade McBrayle's got the shit kicked out of him by eight Michigan State <laughs> players? Like, is that what we're equating it to again? Fault, he shouldn't have skipped. He should right, not and have Colson been... Loveland shouldn't have got swiped across the face and hit his face mask forward. Like, yeah, it was so then, it was so ridiculous, bro. It was the, just the most. The other know. thing too, um, the couple of tweets I saw were like. Kalel Mullings clear as day stomping on somebody. And it's yeah, like, where, what, where, the, who was it? It's been worst, two days. It's like the worst video ever. Like, obviously there was something going on in the middle there, but like there, there's no way that it's clear as day that he's doing that. Anybody's doing anything because it's a video from up top and you really can't see much at all. So if somebody got stomped on that would have came out Saturday night. And maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it'll come out, and we'll have to eat crow on this, and we'll obviously change our tune and our opinion. But, like, if somebody got stomped on, and I saw people that were like, oh, it was a, it was a female staffer, I'm like, okay, if that happened, why is that not out? I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that Michigan State would have had a statement about that, like, immediately after the game. If she would have gone to Coach Smith and said, hey, this is what happened, they would have ran it up the flagpole, It'd be a Big Ten. As they know, should. As they should, for sure. If Colin Mullings did that, then he should probably be suspended for multiple games. And, you know, they they should take, you know, take action. But the, I, I'd be shocked if it did happen and the Big Ten is not stepping in or, or there isn't a statement. So this would have been publicized. This would have been, you know, this would have been released. Um, there would have been some sort of, like you said, statement or just a leak. Right, like yeah, right. They're, they're not like. I don't think that the Michigan State beat would hold on to something like this. Like it would get out there, right? So Correct. I just, I don't know. I just don't. You know, again, we could be wrong, and I just from what we know of Kalel Mullings, obviously you you know Kalel a little bit better, but I've I've met Kalel's parents, great family, uh, great kids, he, right? And like it just would be extremely surprising to me if if anything like that were to have happened. He's like literally one of the nicest guys that I've ever met, and. For him, I'm sure you're in the heat of the moment. So things happen in that, like in battle, when once you strap up the helmet, like guys can turn into different human beings for sure. But I'd still be be surprised. I just like honestly, listen. I I it's a rivalry. It's always gonna be you know chippy. There's always been stuff like <laughs> this. I mean, it's it hasn't just been since the tunnel incident. It hasn't just. It's always been like this. I think that like. If you ask anybody who's ever played in this game, what they'll tell you is like, it's so much different than Michigan, Ohio state, because it's just like, it's chippy at the end of every play. Guys are taking cheap shots on both sides, right? It's just like, that's how it is. And I, I don't know that that's ever going to change. Uh, but Hey, we try you and I, we, we did our we part. Started the olive branch. We, we tried to say, you know, leading up to this, that we were going to have, uh, you know, we're going to try and make this rivalry a little, a little bit more respectful. Um, you know, I do want to say shout out to Spartans illustrated. They were great partners in rivals for a cause, uh, North peak brewing as well. We were able to hit our goal of $5,000 raised for Mott children's hospital to fight pediatric cancer, uh, and fund pediatric cancer research. So pretty proud of that for, for both fan bases. I'll be honest too. Here's what I do know. Michigan State kicked our ass in fundraising, so I'm a you know I'll I'll give it up to them. They fundraised a a, a bunch of money uh, for that. We did not pull our weight, so I'll I'll they they did win that battle. I'd say we won the war, but um I want to give them a little shout out there for for sure. So. No, absolutely. I mean, pediatric cancer. Um, you know, I thank God I've never personally had any sort of any sort of interaction with it, but obviously, you know, especially I feel like if you're a sports fan, you know, you see these feel good stories um, or as feel good as they can be, you know, sometimes they're extremely sad, but I feel like you, you get some exposure to it, right? Because you watch the ESPN make a wish stuff, man. And, and now as a father, it's like, I, I don't know. It's, just, imagine, uh, it's right? different, right? It's a different yeah. perspective on things. So um, shout out to everybody that, that donated. Um, I think it's just an incredible cause and um, you know, Obviously, it's it's a it, you know cancer is such a such a difficult thing in the world for everyone to 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 deal with. I mean, I've dealt with it personally, not not pediatric, but then you know cancer is bad enough, and then you you know you throw in the fact that it's a child, um, probably the maybe one of the worst things in the world that could ever happen. So the yeah, fact sure. that our fan bases can come together and, and donate 
for for a cause like that is is awesome. And um, you know, I'm sure there's there's tons of other causes out there, charitable uh, organizations that are that are doing something about it, which is just you know something you love to see. So football aside, man, it's not important at the end of the day. You know, it's about people, and um, you know these these fan bases can come together. I think that's pretty awesome. For sure. And and one more thing that I wanted to say on just the two fan bases right now is like post game, everyone's going at each other's throats on social media. The thing is in person, I mean, I know it's before the game, but like how many, it was, it was like, awesome. It was awesome. We had, we had tons of MSU fans that were at the tailgate. A bunch of my friends came who are Sparties, but just r- kind of random people too, just showing up um, to the, to the tailgate. And we like, that is, I think John Bacon put it out there. He's like there, he walked through the parking lots and, and the tailgates and everything. He said, that's like one of the most unique things in college sports that the Michigan, Michigan state game is like the only game you'll ever find where every tailgate has some blue and some green, which I think is really cool. Cause like at Michigan, you know, Michigan, Ohio state, un- other than JT bear coming to play flip cup with us, um, you don't see Ohio state fans at a Michigan tailgate very often and vice versa. Um, so it's really cool. I, I just think that like it, this rivalry just gets so damn personal for a lot of people on the internet, on the, Mostly I, on the internet, so right? on the internet like, you have to remember that it's not real life. Right. Yeah. Like, and look, dude, I talk shit like, I, you know, yeah. but it's about the game. Right. And some people, you know, on, on, in, in both fan bases love to just take personal shots on the internet, which I think is, I don't know. I think that's crazy because you have no repercussions and I'm not advocating for anybody to like get in fights. Right. But like, you wouldn't say that in person because you would face repercussions, right? Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting, interesting rivalry in that sense. But I thought the tailgate, the MSU fans, I mean, we were taking shot skis, it was great. Like it was shout so out, much fun. shout out to Truly and Sun Cruiser, because I I loaded up our cooler with Truly Sun Cruiser and Hail IPA and Blue by 90 beer at a hundred times. It was we had to set a record for a beer drink. On that. I mean, the the Bongzilla is like I I had opened a a raspberry Sun Cruiser that I was uh, I had taken one sip of, and it's on one of those you know we had these round tables that uh, that are throughout the tailgate area, and we're loading up the Bongzilla with Sun Cruisers, and so I'm helping, and then I look and I'm like, what happened to that raspberry Sun Cruiser? Somebody grabbed it, poured it in the Bongzilla. I'm like, brother, I was drinking out of that. <laughs> like oh i thought you had just opened it i was like no that was my personal beverage thankfully we had so much that i was able to grab another no problem and i'll tell you the sun cruisers you know pretty easy to go down on the bongzilla man because there's no carbonation you're not feeling bloated um and they're delicious so shout out to sun cruiser truly i uh, still love the truly with the carbonation but sometimes you just want something nice smooth uh, you know, don't want to worry about air bubbles getting in there when you're when you're eating Tormina's pizza as well. Yeah. Just a great tailgate. Yeah, I mean, man. shout out. We had a Hail IPA and Sparta IPA. So if you like, we are we are truly uh, accommodating everybody here. Um, but let's talk about the game for a minute. Yeah. Let's get into it here. First thing I want to talk about is our guy, Davis Warren. I mean, for what he's gone through just this season alone by being benched and you know, struggling at times for sure. But in my opinion, probably being wrongly benched or at least like not being able to stick with him um, in, in some fashion um, for him to come back and play the way that he did, because you think about it, Davis Warren, he now had, that was his fourth start, right? Yep. And two of the four starts were against Texas at home. And against Michigan State and Knight, like it, in a must-win game, in a can't-lose game, right? So he's fi- he's felt the pressure, but I feel like, you know, a lot of guys said he didn't flinch, right? Donovan talked about him post-game. Shiro Moore talked about him, that they, they just said he didn't flinch. And for a guy who has very, very little experience to be able to go in there and not flinch, I think was incredible. He was, what, 9 for 11 or 10 for 11 in the first half? I think it was – um ended up uh 13 for 19 i think so yeah, it was almost 70 percent completion percentage right uh yardage wasn't wasn't great but also took what was there didn't turn the ball over i mean that's the key right that's like the biggest uh, it's, part. It, it's obvious that that's how we've lost football games over the past few weeks and when you don't do it even though you don't play your best game if you hold on to the football things go differently for you so 
I want to give Davis a shout out just for, you know, taking the good with the bad, being, you know, keeping his head held high, supporting Jack Tunnel, supporting Alex Orgy when, you know, when they have played. And, and then he just waited again until he got his shot and he took advantage. And I, you know, I feel like now you, you're going to go with him for the rest of the year. Um, I also, you know, as we're, we're giving Davis Warren props, Alex Orgy as well, dude, you have to give him props for being in the same situation, essentially, where you've gotten benched, you've played poorly at times, but you, everybody, uh, you know, somebody said this to me uh, yesterday, like, it felt like everybody realized their role, finally, right? Alex Orgy realized his role and stuck with it, and Kirk Campbell, let's give him a shout out too, because I thought for the first time, he actually used all those guys right. He used Davis and Orgy in there together correctly, and he called a hell of a game in the second half, I thought. Well, I, there's one that comes to mind because you see Samaj Morgan has one carry for seven yards, but it was down inside the goal line, I believe, or right around the 10-yard line. And it was an awesome concept because Samaj Morgan lines up uh, under, you know, in shotgun uh, behind the center and takes a snap, and it's kind of a do-it-yourself reverse, right? It's right. kind of a – it's it's that's in the – it's so funny because I was like, oh, that's in it's in college well 25. I don't know how to run it because I get I feel like I'm gonna fumble it. But so he goes to the short side of the field. He's got some I can't remember who, but he's got a receiver coming back. So he can he can hand it off or pitch it. And then he he keeps it and he gets us down inside the you know three yard line or whatever. It was a phenomenal play from from Samaj and, and stuff like that was like, okay, this is like obviously you can't do stuff like this on every single uh you know play or every single possession, but just having some of those wrinkles in there again, I I started to really like what I've seen from Kirk last week, the kind of the pop pass end around kind of power sweep to Colston against Illinois. I loved that. Um, I saw, I thought again, some of the play designs were fantastic. I mean, at this point, I think Michigan should not only run a Donovan Edwards pass every single game. I think they should maybe do it every single quarter. Um, you put up his stats four for four, two touchdowns, perfect passer rating or, or whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, I, I really liked what I saw from Kirk in the second half. There were some times that, you know, when Michigan has a chance uh, up 24-17 to kind of put the game away, they go yeah. three and out. They go run, run, pass. Dude, I still think that for whatever reason, we get so tight in that situation of, like, not being able to put the game away. And it, it are already, you know, it caused the USC game to be closer, right? It caused the Minnesota game to be way too close because you took the, the your foot off the gas. I, I don't – he doesn't seem to understand that he can still just run his normal offense, even when you go up and you're trying to milk the clock. No, absolutely. So, you know, still some things to work on. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how much they save. They clearly saved some things for Michigan state. Now, how much do you have in the bag for the number one team of the country coming in? Right. And we'll talk about that later this week, but I just want to see some signs that, okay, they do have things in the, in the repertoire, in the playbook, that they can utilize in really big games where they got to have it. We got something for it. Right. So, um, but yeah, I thought Davis Warren played, played really well, given the circumstances, um, you know, wasn't, it, wasn't it going to wow you, you know, he missed Colson on the first drive and everybody's freaking out. And then he was pretty much, I think hit his next 10 passes and um, that touchdown drive at the end of the first half, I thought was really, really good. Um I thought, yeah, I just thought they played really well. Um, I, I thought, too, honestly, I know you, you mentioned his stat line. If you look at it, though, that's like a a J.J. McCarthy stat line in a game where we, like, it, it had to just battle it out, like, from, yeah. from the, the last couple of years, where, like, you know, obviously, if you're talking the Nebraska game of 52-7 to 7 or whatever that, that score was, then J.J. McCarthy would light up the stat sheet, but – in a lot of those games where we had to like just be, you know, very strategic and stuff, you know, he probably would have gotten to, I, I would say, 200 yards passing, JJ would have. But like it was one of those, that's exactly what you want to see is 13 for 19, not 30 plus passes, right? Right. That's what we're he looking for from these quarterbacks. Well, and if you look at it too, right? I mean, Michigan averaged 5.2 yards per play, which is all right. Uh, Michigan State was at 5.4. So Michigan State outgains uh, Michigan by, by quite a bit. But, um, you know, they had the ball for 37 minutes. Michigan had it for 23. So, you know, you basically have the ball for about, a you know, 35% of the game, right? So your stats are maybe not looking at – you don't run as many plays. And part of that was because Michigan State 
we, when we talk, you know, whenever we talk about defense, I've got some thoughts on on the defense. Uh, even though they only gave up seventeen, they definitely, uh, you know, didn't necessarily. It's carry amazing. Their weight. It's amazing they only gave up seventeen. Um, but let's well, talk, yeah, let's talk about that in a minute. I I want to talk real quick, um, just about for the first time all year, I was like unbelievably pleased and surprisingly uh pleased with how michigan responded to something they they showed that they had grit they showed it was gut check time for sure you know michigan state comes out they were from the get-go the more physical and tougher team right those first the first drive obviously you know it ending up in zero points uh was gigantic for michigan in the end there's no doubt about that yeah. Um, but just in general, like you watched how Michigan state came out and I think everyone's sitting there, like we didn't come to play. Right. And I think that was one of our worries going into this was that Michigan state has more to play for. Um, they play better together as a team. Michigan didn't show any fight in the second half versus Illinois. So you're really struggling. So I thought though, you know, I was really impressed with once Michigan went down, right? When when those first three drives, they go punt, 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 Michigan does. And Michigan State is, uh, I believe it was, I mean, they had gone what? What did they do their first three drives? It was uh, the missed field goal, obviously, which is huge, but then a touchdown. So it should have been 10 nothing at the least, probably 14 nothing, right? And so Michigan State has all the momentum. And Michigan makes i i thought the the aiden child's fumble was the a turning point in the game for sure but yeah. I, just in general like i thought michigan could have packed it up and went home based on how we've seen them play for the past like three weeks um i was really impressed with how they showed their their guts yeah man I, and the thing i would say too because i saw this take going around you know twitter a lot from from msu fans that oh michigan state clearly you know outplayed michigan and um, yeah, I mean, they had more yards, right? But if you look at it, they had 352 yards. 170 of those yards came on three drives where they got three points, right? Wow. So that's that's the first drive of the game where they missed the field goal. It's the drive where they cut it to uh, 16 to 10, uh, right after Michigan had scored to go up 16. Yeah, ten, that's a 10 play, six minute drive, by the way, right? Right. And then they go. Uh, they turn it over on downs at the end of the game. So that's half their yards equating to three points. I think I don't have it up in front of me, but I think if you were to look at Michigan, when they got a drive, they finished it, right? Like they went and they scored and they pulled something out of the bag to ensure that they got into the end zone. And that's the difference, right? Like, you know, if you, you, you cannot you know, out gain your opponent, uh, have a lot of yardage, um, but at the end of the day, if you're not converting in the red zone and converting on those opportunities, when you get close to, to your opponent's end of the field, it's all for naught. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I think that Michigan took advantage when Michigan state made mistakes. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I said this on our, our pod at pretzel bell on Friday night too. Um, my buddy Brett, he famously says this, both teams are going to do stupid things. Hopefully they do more stupid things. Guess what? They did do more stupid things. Um, so I, you know, that's ultimately though, that's college football, right? And for the first time in, I don't know how many weeks we didn't really make stupid mistakes at all, you know, or, or very seldom did we? So no penalties, no turnovers, no penalties, no turnovers. It's weird how you win when that happens, Tanner. It's weird when you play disciplined football that you, Man, like we've been emphasizing that the fundamentals every single week, and for the first time all year, they they put it all together, and it still is sloppy, right? It's still not like they were clicking on on all cylinders, but man, it felt it felt good. And I think uh, to your point, though, like you're looking at this stat sheet if you're a Michigan State fan and saying, "How the hell did we lose this game?" Right? And yeah. you know, I, when they say like they were the better team, I'm. I'm not disagreeing. Like I, I think that they all together, you know, look pretty damn good. Um, so, you know, I got to give Jonathan Smith some respect. I think that they, he has them playing above their talent level. Whereas, you know, that's been something that is a criticism of Sharon Moore that Michigan hasn't played up to their talent level. 
Um, so, but you know, for the first time again, they showed they did a little gut check, and I, you know, let's talk about the offensive line too. I thought the offensive line struggled early on; they they were not getting push. Um, we wrote a story on it on blue by 90.com as well. Um, that Shro Moore actually in his post game presser said that he challenged the offensive line. And after those first three drives of punt, 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 they got points on their next three drives. So I felt like they put it together. What, what were your thoughts on the O line? Yeah, I thought it was better. I thought it was improved. I mean, the run game was not great. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Michigan was kind of just allowing Michigan State to get downfield, uh, get downhill, excuse me. And I felt that Michigan never really took advantage of the uh, the run game outside the tackle box. Um, it was mostly in between the tackles. Uh, and Alex Orgy was the most effective runner all night by far, six carries for 64 yards. But the one thing I want to say, everyone, not just us, but everyone has been critical of Evan Link. When Andrew Gentry went down, and I don't know what that injury was, but I don't think we're going to see Andrew Gentry the rest of the year. Evan Link, I think, played 37 snaps. Do you know how many pressures he gave up? I, I do. Zero. 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 Yeah. That, talk about gut check, right? And that's a young kid, redshirt freshman, man. So he's, what, 19 years old? That's a kid who could be a really good football player and was maybe thrown into the fire, had to overcome some adversity, and, you know, probably, probably play, playing, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds below where ideally he would be as yeah. an upperclassman. And so for him to, to be able to kind of face that adversity, you know, lose his starting job, come back in due to injury and play as well as he did. I think he's thrown in volume, right? right? Right. I mean, it just speaks volume to the type of young man he is. So um, that kind of stuff gets me fired up, right? Like when somebody has a rough start or a rough patch and, and they come back and they play well and they overcome that. Like, I think that shows a lot about somebody's character and their ability to kind of overcome adversity. So I was really excited, man. I, it's not fun to come on here and be like, ah, you know, like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but like we say right tackle, like they're kids, man. At the end of the day, they are young guys who are just trying to figure life out, football out school. They're trying to figure out what they want to do with their, with their careers and all these sorts of things. So I don't like to come on here and be like, oh, man, guys struggled again. Like, I don't want to, you know, crap on kids. So it's uh, it's refreshing for him. I'm sure it's going to be probably a lot more fun to, to, to watch in the film room. Now, the run game, again, got, got to pick up some slack there as a unit. Um, they've been dealing with a lot of injuries. They've had so many different, uh, you know, different five out there all season long due to injury and due to lack of performance. So I also think though, it was a, it's a product, a little bit of Michigan state saying, Hey, we know that you're going to run Kalel Mullings up the gut a hundred times and we're not going to let you do it. Right. Yeah. And so they, you know, they've said it. It's funny though. They've said it the past few years of we're going to make JJ McCarthy beat, beat us. We're going to make, you know, uh, Davis Warren beat us. Right. And, um and then he did you know and so uh three in a row versus versus msu they're all saying the same thing of like we're gonna stop the run and make your quarterback beat us and then our quarterback did beat you so um you might want to you know think of a different thing i i do think having alex orgy in there changed a lot though right because i think that um you know us being able to to change it up a little bit from with the run game and and bring him in was was amazing so um, speaking of having to talk about guys struggle though, let's talk about the defense a little bit. Um, I still, I was, I'll be honest though, to start it off, I was shocked with how they struggled, right? Because I thought going into this, that we were going to plug up the run and especially with Will Johnson out that our past defense was going to struggle. And it was pretty much the opposite actually. <laughs> so we were, you know, I think it was very concerning from the get-go of Michigan State just gashing Michigan in the run game for five, six, seven, eight yards a pop, and, you know, sometimes double-digit yards a pop. I mean, that was as frustrating as it gets. Well, how many? T I'd like to. I'd like to know, and I'm sure that you know, MGO Blog does their reviews and they chart the games, and I'm sure we'll we'll find this out. I'm not going to go back and and look at it, but how many times did Mason Graham line up? On, as an edge or at least as like a five tech what are we doing there was a time when kenneth grant dropped into coverage that's okay i think that's okay right but i don't like if 
Because I think that's something Jesse Minter probably would do, right? And I think the reason you do that is because you try to confuse Aiden Childs and say, okay, you have no idea where pressure's coming from. You have no idea who's dropping. I think the problem is is that uh, Michigan doesn't do enough of that routinely for it to be super effective, right? right. Um, but I, I want to bring this up. I saw this on the on the 247 board. Uh, so the poster, uh, Cody Egg GTS, put this out there. Um, so there were seven third and long situations and i'm gonna read the down and distance and i'm gonna read the yardage justin and i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna watch your reaction uh while i can because i've got to read it off screen third and 12 seven yards third and 10 30 yards third and 12 20 yards third and 10 14 yards third and nine eight yards third and seven five yard loss it's ideal third and nine 34 yards giving up 30 yards on a third that third and long i know that third and two is feel more crazy. confident with a third it's and one crazy man i mean the one i thought was a really good play call where in Charles dropped it into the was it the tight end or, or fullback maybe or somebody i think um, so i i thought that was a really good play call for them to be honest but still like so frustrating that you're letting that guy leak out you know um i i think that this is where like jesse minter was a dog on third and long, right? If, if you got in a third and long situation against Jesse Minter's defense, you might as well pack it up. Send the punt unit out, out on third down because because you, you're not getting it. And this has happened all year long. Let's be honest. Like, if, if you can get off the field on third down, the first half against Texas is actually a very different game, right? Yeah. That that was like, it, it's been all year long where Michigan has, has dominated first and second down and then gotten gashed on third down, and that's how they keep, you know, the offenses keep kept drives alive. Um, and it's just so frustrating, man, as a fan. And and I think it's defeating as a player, too, when you're like, okay, we got him, got him, got him. Oh, no, we don't. Back it up. You know, I think that's really frust- frustrating. No, it is. And I think, again, I just, like, the tackling is bad. Pursuit angles are bad. The rush lane discipline, you get pressure on Childs. And, yes, he's an athletic guy, but you don't have any any discipline. Nobody's home to make the sack when you when you force him out of the pocket or force him up into the pocket. And um, just so many different things that you see that are just such a contrast from last year. And, yes, again, we know they've lost players, but there's still a lot of guys here that should be able to play and uh, be able to wrap up and make tackles. I mean – um, you know, Makari Page had one of his worst games tackling that I've seen in his Michigan career. So I don't understand what what changes um, could could go into effect to make a team worse at tackling. It's one thing if a younger guy is struggling, but when it's guys that we've seen be extremely consistent at Michigan and make plays throughout their career, start the moment you switch to you know a new coaching staff, just start to kind of stink it up. It's like, well, I, we've seen these guys play well. Right. And it's not like you can pinpoint, oh, well, Rod Moore's not out there. So Makari Page is going to struggle at tackling. That's not really how that works. Right. Like if there's a coverage thing, okay. Yeah. Maybe, you know, still getting on the same page with some of these guys. But my goodness, this, I mean, these guys cannot wrap up for the life of them. It's, 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 it's it's nauseating. It it is. It's crazy. And it's, and it's been a problem all year long. And that's like, talk about frustrating to watch is when you have a guy you know, wrapped up and then he still squeaks loose. And I, I remember there, I think it was later in the game, there was a Nate Carter run where he kind of stays up, puts his hand down and stays up and gets an extra 20 some yards. Um, that might have been one of the third and 30, third downs that they got 30 plus yards. Um, but um, it, it, it is very frustrating. You know, I want to get Nate Carter is very good. I, I like Lynch yeah, Adams. Like 180 Ooh. yards. He's a Man. dog. I mean, he was good last year for them against he was, Michigan. He's really, really good. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you know, outside of him and uh, him and Childs, like, is anybody uh, more talented on Michigan State's offense than Michigan State's defense? Right? We should be able to out talent them at pretty much every position outside of maybe a couple. Right. And so that's where you're sitting here, like, man, it, this, you know, you should. If you're looking at on paper Michigan State's offense versus Michigan's defense, Michigan shouldn't let up more than seven points on the game. And yeah. it, I think to your point, the way that they gave them up is is the most frustrating. Where right from the get go, you know Michigan State is just pounding the ball, and and Michigan is letting them 
like a let him through like a sieve. Um, and then, like you said, the missed tackling is just so frustrating. So, um, as much as it looks like you played well because you only gave up 17, I think it's you know, uh, if you look a little bit deeper, uh, not so great for Michigan's defense, and they still have a lot to clean up. Um, the one thing I will say, like, I know in Giles, 17 for 23 is a great, like, that's a great passer percentage, um, completion percentage, but uh you know you pretty much bottled him up and didn't let him do crazy Aiden Childs things right yeah yeah and and the one thing I would say too and I want to I want to touch on two points with this one stat here um do you know who's leading the NFL in uh points a game against I'm gonna guess it's Jesse Minter it is Jesse Minter so um yes great defensive coordinator um you miss him a lot Right. It's, it's a, clearly, it, it's, it's, it's a downgrade, man. I'm, you know, whatever you want to say, because, you know, Wink Martindale with the Giants, with the Ravens, you know, has not really been great for, you know, a, a few years at least um, when he was with the Ravens. So, um, second point I'd like to make, no one gives a shit about your science, brother, because Jesse Minter is showing how good of a defensive coordinator he is. It does not matter. He is, he is going to be an NFL head coach in the next two years, and he's going to win a lot of football games. So real, real quick on that before this is a total tangent, but um, Jim Harbaugh, as, as while we're talking about the Chargers, he literally had NFL grown professional men singing for he's a jolly good fellow in the locker room after the game. Well, what is it? He's the weirdest man on planet Earth, but he'll somehow get 30 year old men to sing for he's a he's jolly Ted good Lasso. Fellow. Ted Lasso was based on him. It, it is it's it's insane what he's been able to do and talk about missing somebody i i just miss him so sorry go on go on with your uh your stuff. no that that's all that i had to say i mean you know i think that there's certainly enough talent on this defense for michigan to maybe upset some teams down the stretch i just don't know if lining mason graham up on the edge is going to be what you want to do to win those sorts of games. You're going to basically have to be perfect. I just don't know if, if Wink's going to be able to call a perfect game like Jesse Minter can. I have a really hard time looking at Michigan's defense against number one Oregon's offense with Dylan Gabriel and saying, yeah, they're going to play well. But You heard me on Saturday. What's that? You, it you was, win Saturday, you get momentum, <laughs> they got to come to the big house, you never know what can happen. It was, Crazier things have happened. The funniest thing, too, when – so. I'm like trying to load up the cooler. It's only like two o'clock or something. So you, the, the excuse of, it's not like you were like drunk ranting or anything, but I overhear Tanner from across the tailgate say, all right, you win Saturday against Michigan state, you get momentum. Number one, Oregon's got to come into town. You can beat them. Then you beat Indiana on the road. Then you beat Ohio State on the road. You talked yourself into us being in the playoff at nine and three, which is unbelievable. And I, I, I thought I was dying laughing. I it was, was dying. you know, I just wanted to keep the vibes up. I was told my vibes were low on You're the great vibes. Yeah. And you know, um, I also um, <laughs> I, there was a on Netflix. They came out with a, a documentary on the 04 Red Sox and their comeback against the Yankees. And there was a 30 for 30 on that, but this one's a little bit more, you know, expansive as far as how they, you know, how long it is, like three hours long. It's awesome, by the way. But I think I kind of stole that from um, from Kevin Millar, uh, if you remember him back in the day. But he was like telling, um, I think it was Dean Shaughnessy, who's a Boston, uh, you know, writer in the, in the, in the sports world in, in Boston. And he's like, he's like, don't let us win tonight because game five. We got Pedro, game six, Schilling, game seven, anything can happen. And that was basically my mantra of, like, you never know what could happen. You, you know, Michigan, Ohio happen. State, the game, you never know what could happen, right? So, you know, we'll talk about Oregon. Um, I was a little overzealous, I'm going to be honest. But, hey, you know what? Yeah, five okay. and three, back on schedule, still should have been seven and one coming into the Oregon game, like I said a month ago, but it is what it is. We got the Ducks coming to town. Three hour time difference. It's been tough for these teams. It has. So. It has. I I you know, you never know. You never know. There's a lot of pressure as playing as the number one uh team in the nation as well. So you never know. But more importantly, uh Paul is in Ann Arbor it, for for a while, for another three hundred and sixty five days. So I'm pretty pumped about that. Um I think that it's you know, this one, it is 
it was it was a can't lose game, right? So you're just you're thrilled to have that one. Um, we'd be talking. It, it would be talk about vibes. It would be very negative vibes if you would lose that one at home. Um, but one thing that you have to say about Sheryl Moore is he, as a head coach, whether it's interim or a uh, real head coach, has not lost to Michigan State, Penn State, or Ohio State. So, I mean, pretty damn good. I, I think that's something, it, you know, you have to put an emphasis on it if you are the head coach of, of Michigan. And um, it's something that, you know, a lot of people pre-2021 just – crushed Jim Harbaugh for was not being able to beat his rivals and uh he's the first guy to beat Michigan Michigan State in his first year as head coach like ever or 1948 1948 right so 76 um, years ago it I mean that's a long time and also just in general too like I think the stats were out there of Michigan hadn't beaten a decent Michigan State team in a long time. The only time that Michigan had beaten, you know, Michigan State was when they were three and nine or, you know, four and eight or whatever else. So um, even though, you know, this is, you know, Michigan State's still four and four and they're in year one after, you know, after uh, bringing on Jonathan Smith, I still think that's a good win to, you can feel good about that win. Um, because they're a program that is on the rise, I think, right now. And Trell Moore is going to have to keep up. Like, that is, you know, something you can't count them out. They're not, you know, Mel Tucker-less uh, uh, Michigan State anymore. So, um, I think you feel good about getting this one, right? Well, I was going to say to your point about, you know, how Jim Harbaugh was crushed. Remember the stat they would they would bring up? And it was true. But they would say, hey, well, you know, Michigan in their last six versus Michigan and Ohio State. Michigan State and Ohio State are one at five. You know what they are their last six against Michigan State and Ohio State now, Justin? Six and oh. Love that shit. Love that shit. So, you know. And nine and oh if you count Penn State, right? So. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I mean, uh, it's one of those things where things have kind of turned on its head. And, um, you know, rivalries go back and forth. And so there will be there will be moments where Michigan will lose some of these games. But for now, sitting here, you know, last six. Uh, feeling pretty good about things. It's it's funny those graphics don't quite make the rounds as as much I as know. the one five ones do. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of weird. I don't know. Um, maybe we could put something together for Ryan Day, just you know, as a token of our friendship, and just you know. By the way, they should have lost to Nebraska. I'm just saying anything you anything can happen. Yeah, it's in the shoe. That team kind of stinks right now. That team that team should have lost to Nebraska. If Nebraska scores on fourth and goal uh it's the running back doesn't be. stretch the ball it's fourth and goal if he fumbled and so be it like he would have scored he if he just stretches the, the ball um look that's a very talented ohio state team but they are not playing up to what they should be and uh you know if anybody wants to come back and clip this all of your fan base is saying the exact same thing i'm just i'm just spreading the gospel here so I don't, like don't hate the messenger the the other thing if we want to talk throw a little shade at msu right now which i i like doing from time to time okay is um, you know, if you want to flip that narrative, like Michigan State just lost to the worst Michigan team since tw- in a in over a decade, right? Um, yeah, we don't count twenty twenty. I mean, that's just like a fake year, um, which then invalidates Ryan Day's one playoff win. So I'm down with that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely the worst team since fourteen. I would say because you know people talk about the twenty seventeen team. The twenty seventeen defense was very good. Uh, very, very good, and put Michigan in a position to win most of its games, except for Penn State that year. So, yeah, I think you know, hey, sometimes you, uh, sometimes you got a bad team, and you know, you still win some of your rivalry games, which I'll take. Also, if uh, last thing here, if you would have told me that Colel Mullings was going to have thirteen carries for eighteen yards, I'd be like, okay, what do we lose by thirty? Like, we, there's no way we scored a single point. Right. So again, I just want to give this team uh, credit for finding a way. Like, I want to give real quick. I just thought of this because I know my prediction was close. I said 24 20. You know yeah. who was spot on? Our boy DJ Array, 24 17. He called it. 17. I yep. love that. I was three points off. I basically just copied his. Like, well, I can't take 24 17. I got to take 24 20. 
But I think Nolan said 2417 as well in the group chat. So that's just a classic, like, I don't know if we're going to win, but I think we probably will win score prediction, right? Like, that's why I just throw out there, you know, I throw that out there. It was like, hey, if we're going to win, it's going to be ugly and close. So that's going to be my. It was a rock fight. It was, it did, it was tier point sloppy in like a rain game, even though there was no rain. I also want to say shout out to the Spartan Illustrated guys. But do you think Paul knows who Josiah Stewart is now? Probably not still, but okay, um, but he should. He should. On yeah. our, our live pod on Friday at the Pretzel Bell, shout out Pretzel Bell, uh, I brought up Josiah Stewart and our good friend Paul from Spartan Illustrated said, I don't know who that is. And then he had a huge forced fumble sack on Eden's Childs to give Michigan an additional three points. And if Kenny Grant had picked that ball up, he would have scored. But he, he was traumatized from the USC game. <laughs> he did. He you said can that literally too. like see it in his actions that he was like, "Nope, I'm falling on this thing." He would have scored because he he got a look. He kind of got up and looked around. I was like, "Ah, shit! There's nobody around me." Yeah, he um, would have scored. It would have been because we we said we need a big man touchdown. That would have been electric if he scored there. But hey, that was the play of the game, in my opinion. That was, and, yeah. and also that was a. I think Jonathan Smith is very smart and like calculated in his risks. That was dumb to, to try to score with 17 seconds left from your own 30 with a turnover prone quarterback. Like that's, that's what's going to happen. Like, I feel like if you're a Michigan state fan, you're like, you already know what's going to happen in that scenario when you're going out. Like that, that's exactly how Aiden Childs, you know, that's the play that's made there. So, um, I, I think you, if you're Michigan State, I know you're, you're, it would have been what, 7-7 seven, seven at the time? Um, seven, so, six. so, yeah, we've, we missed the, uh, or we didn't convert on the, the yeah, there's got to be a conversation about the, uh, both the punter and the holder. Um, kind of rough, rough season, unfortunately. For a guy who last year was really good in the first half of the season, I don't know what happened. Like, I, I don't know either, man. I think it's got to be mental. It's got to be mental. Yeah, you need like a sports psychologist type of, of figure, and um, you know, rest in peace to Grant Varden. These are the things that that, that Greg would you know, sell at, right? Like, um, so yeah, it's it's one of those things that's tough to see because a kid who I thought had a potential to play in the NFL and has just been really struggling, but then you, you couple in not only are we you know seeing Michigan struggle and and kind of the punt game and, and where they maybe can use some better field position um, success, then you have, uh, you know, a, a muffed uh, snap, right? And it, it takes a point off the board. That, that could have been huge, I right? Mean, and thankfully Michigan was able to get back with the two point, but. Dude, that's like, those are the, the things that can lose you games, right? Like you, say you point to, um, and, and I mean, uh, let's be honest, them missing the field goal with Jonathan Kim, who's probably the best kicker in the Big Ten, maybe the country. Like he had six field goals a week ago, right? right? And them missing a, a field goal from the five yard line lost them the game, in my opinion, right? Like that changes everything. So um, I know we ended up winning by seven, but still, like if you know if they go up there and it's ten nothing, right? It's um, it's tough. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you're just happy to get this one for sure. If you're Michigan, you're happy to walk away with this one. Um, the last thing that I want to chat about, uh, this could open up a whole, th- uh, whole can of worms, but is Michigan seven and one if Davis Warren is the starting quarterback all the way through? I don't know, man. I watch him throw the ball. It comes out a lot, a lot with a lot more velocity than any of the other guys on the roster. Um, I think he processes information a little bit quicker. And I also think he has the most room to grow. He's got the most potential. He's got the highest ceiling. Uh, maybe outside of Alex Orger, if Alex Orger was able to, you know, like, can we combine these guys? Like, we just morph them morph into one them quarterback? Together. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's tough to say. Um, I think defensively against Washington, especially, the, the team really kind of struggled. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, you are in that game be- like – you know, think about how many how many drives you gave up against Washington and got nothing. Sure. From it. The first yeah. three with Alex Orgy, and then two of them with a fumble and an interception by Tuttle, right? And so yeah. I'm not saying that that you know you can't come out here and say that Davis Warner was going to make zero mistakes, right? He was going to have zero turnovers because that's not what it showed in the first you know in his starts. But 
you know, if Davis Warren was able to play like he did on Saturday where, you know, it's nothing crazy. You're not doing anything nuts. Uh, but we said that from the get go, man, from before the season, I said, you never really asked JJ to do anything crazy unless it was like third and 12 and he'd have to do JJ things. But after that, you know, it, it's, you're, you're running a very calculated offense and that's exactly what they did on Saturday. So kind of frustrating to see that now. I mean, hindsight's 2020, of course. And I think that, you know, it, it's after the Arkansas state game, it was like, okay, we got to see what else we have. Right. But, um, you know, here we go. I, I just want to give him another shout out because man, I think that anybody, anybody would have given him like, Hey, you shut it down after you throw three picks in a game and you get benched and there, you know, you haven't played in what, four weeks now, three weeks. So it, it's like, okay, you know, for you to be able to come back and play the way you did was phenomenal. So, um, got, got to give it up to him, but Hey, listen, Paul lives in Ann Arbor. Um, it's a life is always good when Paul's in Ann Arbor. So I'll take that for sure. But, uh, um, you know, we'll be back in the big house this week. Uh, number one team coming into town. So you never know. You never know what can you happen. You just don't ever know what will happen. You never know. So uh, for us, you can follow us at Blue by 90 on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Blue, Blue by 90 podcast on YouTube and Blue by 90.com. We appreciate you. Go Blue. Go Blue.